Okay, so um, we've decided that because we need to switch things from one computer to another, we're going to um, we're going to open up first for um, a Q and A where you can ask Will yes. all about this amazing talk that he's about to give. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'm Ken Perlin, by the way. I'm at NYU. Hi. Thanks. And and um, and we can just I mean are these mics live for questions or you know people can just talk to Will I mean here he is in New York it's really exciting <laughs> yeah um, Doing so tech uh, support on the floor first question is if you guys need a hand <laughs> oh I'm sure we could use a hand I think we need a uh, good video connector though. anyone here ever use a computer <laughs> I, yeah I, <laughs> um, so so really I mean it's going to take them a few minutes anyone have any questions about stupid fun club stupid fun club <laughs> It's stupid, it's fun, we build robots. Uh, doing a lot of different things in cross-media. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really talk about the projects right now, but um, you know, we're basically initiating ideas that we want to take to different platforms, thinking about entertainment you know, as one entire platform, because typically entertainment's done in these different silos. You, know, you have movie companies over here, game companies over there, and if the movie's successful, they might decide to make a game out of it, or vice versa, but that's always an afterthought. Uh, and so what we're trying to look at is basically if you were to treat entertainment as one platform, how would you approach it? And uh, so that's kind of our charter. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really talk about the specific projects beyond that. Okay, let me pull this guy up. I'll take more questions though while I'm... <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess found... Oh, good. <laughs> That's a good sign. It's left right there. I guess fun is the, one of the most uh, important factors in designing games, like the core mechanic to be fun. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the most uh, games from, for learning out there are just no fun? <laughs> and what can be done? Well, I, I think it's easy to make... Is it crashy? Like, learning is fun? Or? I mean, you can make a boring movie. Oh, the question was... Um, Games are supposed to be fun. That's really, the, you know, the essence of a game. How come um, serious games, is that what you're asking about in specific? Serious games, like for social change and whatnot, uh, just aren't fun. Uh, I think that's really an issue, you know, of craftsmanship, not necessarily of topic. I'm convinced that you can take any topic and make it fun, uh, you know, but you can make a movie about the most interesting thing in the world and make it boring as well. So, uh, you know, I think that a lot of times it's about changing the perspective that you have on a subject. You know, a lot of times people take like kind of the obvious, let's do a game about fighting malaria. And you know, you're put in the position of the Peace Corps or whatever. And these are all the, the verbs that a player typically would have in terms of fighting malaria, you know. And a lot of times if you flip the perspective around, you know, what if in fact you were playing the game as malaria and your objective was to take out as many humans as you could? And maybe it's a multiplayer game. Maybe the other person's playing Ebola. This person's playing swine flu. And that's the scoring system. You know, I think that that's one of the values of games is that we can kind of get into somebody else's shoes, you know, a different driver's seat, and see the same issue from a totally different perspective. And I think a lot of the fun can come from just kind of that total shifting of mindset on a subject. And so I think a lot of times in serious games, people approach it almost too straightforwardly. And they don't kind of play with the concept enough, because I think even in the development of an idea, you need to have an inherent sense of playfulness in terms of how you might approach it. So, yeah. <clears throat> what are your thoughts in general about social gaming on Facebook? Um, and do you feel that these type of games could be used for more than just fun and rather for learning or for advancing certain uh, important causes? Oh, certainly, it's just a platform. I mean, you can do a game on any platform that I think can address whatever cause you want. I think, you know, a lot of these light social games on Facebook point to a really interesting dynamic, which is that uh, the more a game is about somebody, the more personal it is to them, the more, you know, emotionally engaged they get. And in some sense, the game, game can be far less immersive, you know, kind of far worse graphics, whatever. But uh, if it's about me, you know, a lot of social games really, they're centered on my social network. And I think people inherently are kind of narcissistic. And so if the game is about them, um, a lot of other aspects of the game can be much lighter, uh, maybe have a lot less time and effort and uh, investment in them. So I think that's one of the reasons why you th see things like Farmville taking off. And not so much that it's about you, but also that it's involving your friends and there's a currency. And it's the social currency between you and your friends and that kind of commitment that's the stickiness. It's not so much the gameplay or what you're seeing on the screen. 
I think that is a huge trend I'm seeing in games right now. You know, games used to be all about how immersive was the game, and I'm cutting out the world, I'm falling into this Walter Mitty immersive experiences, you know, and just blocking everything else out. And now more and more, you know, it's about, uh, you know, acknowledging who you are, who your friends are, these social connections outside of the game is now becoming part of the landscape of the game, in essence. From what I saw, it's also about an emotional attachment to things in the game. Right, not just within the game, but also between you and the other players that are gifting you things and coming in and taking care of your farm when you're on vacation, stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, again, I think your social landscape becomes the primary landscape for a game like that rather than this mythical, you know, Middle Earth. So, and I think because of that, people just right off the bat have a much deeper kind of engagement with the experience, you know, despite the fact that the rest of the game is very seemingly light. I think we might have the technical problem solved. Well, except we're running on the Windows partition. Um, so equal time for everyone. We tried it under Linux. It didn't work. Um, OK, so I'm just going to pretend that I'm starting now. All right, so bear with me. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Ken Perlin, director of the Games Learning Institute. And Will Wright, I'm going to embarrass him now. Will Wright is, um, is an old friend of mine. He may also be the single most influential person in the world. <laughs> in the sense... In my mind, yeah. In the sense that... He wrote all this stuff. In the sense that um, his trust in the minds of young people, in the power of their creativity and intelligence, has already taught several generations that interactive entertainment does not need to be mindless. It can be thoughtful and empowering. It can be literature. Every game Will makes, makes society better. Before SimCity, how many people have played SimCity? Before, Sim, before SimCity, nobody would have believed that people around the world could be engaged in a serious activity about a grown-up problem and call it fun. Before The Sims, everybody knew that only boys like computer games. Now, of course, we know better. Before Spore, nobody thought that millions of kids could have fun being creators of their own worlds, not just consumers, but active producers. And now other games, as I'm sure you've noticed, are emulating those insights. So Will's current work is even more revolutionary. Apparently, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Uh, I'm promising to upend the entire notion of consumer and producer. So we are very fortunate to have Will as an advisor to the Games Learning Institute, and in a few moments you'll see why, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Will Wright. Thank you. So sorry about the technical problems we've been having. Um, I hope you all can see that fine. Uh, so Kim came to, asked me to come and give this talk. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, that was the right one. <laughs> That was the one I was going to give, but then I told Ken I'd give this entire talk, and then at the very end say it was the opposite day. But uh, this is the one I, in fact, he wanted me to give. Uh, one thing I've noticed, you know, and uh, in games, one of the things you end up studying a lot are kind of demographics, you know, almost like an anthropologist and the way people kind of deal with information, the way they absorb it and whatnot. I've noticed that, you know, there's a big gender difference, I mean, not gender, uh, generational difference and the amount of information that people can absorb. And I think that's kind of one of the things that game makers are always kind of dealing with. I've always thought that there's something that I might call the information absorption constant, which basically divided by your age would kind of indicate roughly how much information you could take in through your senses. Uh, and I think game makers are kind of dealing with that a lot. You know, my estimate of it is it's around uh, 3,000, which means that a 10-year-old can probably take in about 300 bytes a second and actually kind of absorb that. Uh, if we multiply that out, we kind of get these numbers. Um, you know, my assumption generally when I'm talking to an audience is that I'm talking to a 20-something year old audience, which uh, may be off, you know, this is probably a much wider demographic uh, than I typically talk to. But if we take that number times 60, that's about 9,000 bytes a minute that you should be able to absorb roughly. Now if a picture is worth 1,000 words, which is uh, a word, of course, in computer science is a 16-byte unsigned integer, so about two bytes, that should be about 2,000 bytes per picture. So that means I should be able to push five slides a minute on you. So over 60 minutes, that's about 300 slides. This is uh, slide number three. <laughs> oh. Now, as a game developer, uh, you know, I'm aware that people kind of have this image of games, you know, culturally, that I'm always kind of dealing with. Um, you know, it's something that I, I kind of fret about, but, uh, you know, and 
occasionally it kind of hits me in very unexpected ways. A few years ago, I was asked to curate the show at the Vancouver Art Gallery. It was a very kind of innovative show, including you know manga, comics, graphic novels, uh, games. I was curating the game section, and I was actually talking to this uh, interviewer from the LA Times, and she had been talking to a lot of the other curators that he curated, the comic book sections and stuff. And uh, then she came to interview me, and we were talking, and she mentioned something that was really interesting to me. You know, these people that had created manga and graphic novels, when they found out that there were computer games included in the exhibit, they were a little bit distraught. Like, games? What are they doing? They're not an art form. And, you know, to have comic book people basically looking down on you, <laughs> uh, you know you're at the bottom of the barrel, you know, culturally. But I think that, you know, that's always been a property of media as it evolves, that, you know, whenever a new format comes out, uh, that the previous ones kind of, you know, thumb their nose at it, you know. So I think that's just kind of to be expected, is like the new kid on the block with games. Um, you know, and I think parents kind of have this impression of games too, especially if they don't play games. Uh, I read this passage a while back that was great. It was describing a guy that walked into a room, and there was somebody in the corner of the room playing with this device, and he was totally immersed in it. You know, he didn't even notice him walk in the room, and it creeped him out that this person, you know, seemingly was possessed by the devil because he was so absorbed in this device that he blocked out the entire world. And it turned out this passage was written in the 15th century, and it was the first time he'd actually seen somebody reading a book. And uh, there was a monk in the corner reading a book, and, you know, he was convinced that this was the devil's device, that it could absorb this guy so thoroughly to take his attention away. But, you know, all these formats have actually gone through tremendous changes, you know, from their inception. You know, the earliest storytelling, you know, has very little resemblance to what we now consider storytelling. You know, visual arts, written word, all these things have kind of gone through, you know, tremendous changes, you know, through their development. You know, games, of course, are at the, you know, very early stages. You know, the first writing really was a way to keep track of how much grain you had. It was just purely bookkeeping. Um, you know, over time, people started you know, writing religious text in that. And, you know, these monks spent a long time transcribing, you know, Bibles and religious things. And it wasn't even so much that they were trying to make, uh, you know, more books, but really the wealth of a monastery was really measured in how many books that they had on hand. But in some sense, it was also a form of worship, of venerating the Word of God, just in sitting there and transcribing it. Um, I doubt those monks could have ever foreseen kind of what this, you know, art form was going to evolve into. Uh, and really, you know, this is a property of a couple things. You know, it was a property of all of a sudden being able to make these things very cheaply and easily. But at the same time, there was kind of a chicken and egg problem of having enough literacy in the world. So people actually had to kind of learn to consume this art form into such a way that it became mass media and became applied to a much broader range of things than it had been. Uh, comic books, you know, really actually started out as, um, in some ways, religious propaganda. Uh, this is actually an old print, you know, showing how Jesus would wash the feet of his followers, whereas the Pope would demand people wash his feet. It was kind of anti-Catholic. Uh, um, later kind of evolved into things like uh, political satire. Uh, this is way before comic books or graphic novels, any of that stuff. Um, even established, you know, art forms, people working in them don't always see kind of where these things are going to go, even in the near term. It's amazing how some of these art forms will evolve over just a few years in a direction that even the people working in that format uh, didn't foresee. Uh, and we're used to, like, you know, in Silicon Valley, West Coast, where I'm from, people are always kind of hyping these technologies, how this is going to change the world, this is the next big thing. Uh, and it's interesting going back and reading, you know, inventors of old technologies that when they were hyping things, you know, this is Alexander Graham Bell hyping <laughs> the telephone, right? Um, basically trying to get investors. Uh, you, know, he, you know, he always, uh, it kind of makes sense because he kind of foresaw the value of this when world leaders can diffuse, you know, national crises on the telephone <laughs> that would have great value, you know, in that situation. He just didn't foresee that teenagers would be using this to meet their friends at the mall, you know, texting on their little cell phones. You know, and nowadays there are almost as many actual active uh, phone lines as there are people on the planet, which is pretty amazing. Um, the television is a great example of this, you know, in some sense it kind of feels, you know, a lot of people think of the television as kind of a failed opportunity. Uh, you know, people thought that it would bring the world into your home. The educational impact of television on the world would just be tremendous. And it has been in some sense. You know, we have some good educational program, but we also have Dukes of Hazard. Um, and so I think a lot of people kind of feel like the television uh, is in some sense a lost opportunity. <laughs> Alan Turing invented, you know, the original computer, really, the British bomb, which was uh, designed to break the Enigma code during World War II, you know. And I'm pretty sure he didn't foresee the fact that little kids would be killing simulated Nazis, you know, 40 years later with basically the same device. Uh, you know, even the DARPA, you know, which built the internet, 
uh, probably did not imagine that we'd be using it to trade rare Pokemon cards or download porn, you know. So these directions these technologies go, these formats, these media, you know, are almost by their nature unexpected. You know, they typically start, you know, solving very specific problems. Uh, but then over time, as they evolve wider and wider use um, in exploration, people are just diversifying the use of these things, they start evolving into mass entertainment. And once they become mass entertainment, really, you know, where games are now, the lowest of the low, is when then they start aspiring toward artistic expression. So I think this is actually an arc that I've seen almost all these different media formats kind of go through. So it's kind of not surprising to me that games are kind of uh, dealt with that way culturally. But now there's a really interesting kind of uh, trend right now in terms of really recognizing games for what they really are, in some sense, learning. Uh, we face a fundamental problem as, you know, individuals in the world, in that we have the world out there and us over here. Uh, we have to interact with the world. We have to learn to interact with the world. You know, what we know of the world comes through all of our senses. You know, it's processed in our brain, and then we behave accordingly. You know, kind of stimulus response. Now, in that, you know, black box of our head, you know, we have our imagination. In, you know, my view of the world, we're building models of the world continuously uh, in our imagination. Uh, models of various aspects of the world at various resolutions. But whenever we're, you know, and we're doing this at various scales, too. We're doing this minute to minute, hour to hour, and even year to year across our entire life. In our imagination, we're running these models trying to decide, you know, should I do A or B? And I run the simulation on my head to decide what to do, and that basically determines my action. Uh, in this imagine, imagination that we have, this kind of, you know, supercomputer that we're simulating the world with, there are a lot of different kind of subcomponents to that. Uh, classification, causality, empathy, agency are just a few of the major ones that I kind of think of in terms of a designer. You imagine you're walking through the forest one day and you come across this, you know, in an eye blink, you know, in your head, in your imagination, you instantly classify, you know, what is this thing? Uh, then you, you know, have an empathic reading of it, you know, is it awake, is it alive, does it look hungry? Uh, what is it, you know, likely to do? Which then kind of goes to causality. What is the next, you know, most likely course of events that's going to happen from this point on? And then agency, you know, what can I do to affect this situation? And then you choose a course of action according to that. Now, uh, you know, and this is all just, you know, from the sense, you know, data coming in through your senses, you know, eventually you're doing a course of action in a split second, you're running through this whole chain. You know, if you're walking through the forest and you come across uh, this, you know, you're pretty much getting a very similar data coming into your senses, but right off the bat, in the classification step, you know, you're going a different direction because you've classified it as a painting of a tiger now. Uh, so this, you know, point's been made before, but it's amazing, like, humans, their processing ability and the way we look for patterns in everything. Um, how many of you see a pattern in this picture? And this is, you know, kind of a typical, you know, this is, there's a dog in there. Uh, how many of you see a pattern in this picture? Um, people, you know, one thing about our brain is that we're always searching for patterns, even when they don't exist. We tend to find patterns in things. Uh, you know, I think metaphor is one of the lowest levels of that, where we look for similarity between any two things. And we start finding these symbolic connections, you know, at very different levels uh, between things. You know, in a lot of cases, you know, we might call it metaphor if it's a very simple comparison. But if we have enough metaphors that kind of arrange around a certain thing, we actually start building what we call schema, which are abstractions of this kind of repeated pattern that we're seeing over and over. Um, we might even attach, you know, symbols to a particular schema, give it a name, and now we can reference that symbol. But that symbol is representing an abstraction, which is based upon a large amount of examples, data that we've come across. Um, you know, you've all heard the light bulb joke repeatedly, and you all have basically a schema for that joke, which goes something like this. So your head is full of schema. Um, in fact, most of the stuff you're interacting with in the world is, you know, being classified. You know, you're always sorting into you know, an existing schema I have, or maybe this doesn't fit one, and I'm starting to build a new schema. This is a lot of what the learning process is. It's amazing how even like a five-year-old can pretty reliably tell you the difference between a dog and a cat. But if you were, you know, forced to answer and describe what's the difference between a dog and a cat, it's actually very subtle, and it's no one feature. It's, you know, it's kind of a statistical collection of various features and how they relate to each other. But yet, this is something that we learn to do at an extremely early age. You know, this is a classification schema. Um, other schema are based around different things. You know, you've all been to plenty of restaurants, and you have an expectation when you go into a restaurant that there's a certain sequence of events that you're going to encounter. Not all these happen at every restaurant, but for you, it's kind of a causal schema, causality of what's likely to happen when you go into a restaurant. And then, again, this is built over you going to you know hundreds of restaurants during your life. But do all these schema effectively? What we need are large amounts of examples that we're building them out of. You know, so this is a fundamental problem in learning. Um, you know, more important schema that happen as we're dealing with social beings, you know, as humans, are things like empathy. You know, I think that we, in fact, have to, you know, this is something that we learn at a much earlier age, how to read the, you know, intense motivations, uh, potential behaviors of other people around us. 
As simple creatures, you know, we actually can deal with a very simple schema. You know, if all we really have to worry about is, you know, food or danger, or fight or flee, it's pretty much a classification schema, you know, for a shark, for instance. Um, as we start living around humans, it is a much more complicated uh, issue because humans, you know, the degree of empathy that I need to kind of have to understand what they're likely to do, the range of their behaviors, the range of my agency, all these things increase to make, you know, a much wider range of possible possibilities that I have to deal with in surviving that environment. Uh, the amount of empathy that we can actually, I mean, the amount we read another person through empathy is actually quite remarkable. When you think about uh, somebody you know really well, just imagine that in your head you have a view of what they think of you. You kind of have a sense of what their world model is of you based upon how you've acted around them previously. Uh, you know, think about how you act around your family versus coworkers. You know, you try to stay basically uh, consistent with the way your family sees you and you try to stay consistent with the way your coworkers think of you. Even though those are really two different people, you're trying to act true to that model that you know is in their head, their simulation of you. Um, and even a little bit deeper, you know, you have a little bit of a sense of kind of what their model is of themselves in you or something like that. But uh, this just goes really deep, you know, and we do this so subconsciously we don't even think about it. But um, like I was saying, you need a lot of examples to build these schema. And one of our fundamental problems is that we kind of live with this limited bubble of experience in our life. We only have so many experiences that we can build effective schema out of. But I think evolution has actually discovered other methods to kind of give us more data for schema. One of these methods is for us to have toy experiences, experiences that aren't real, that we can still build abstractions and patterns out of, and later apply those abstractions to real life experiences. Um, we can also learn from others. You know, it might be that my friend the caveman left the cave and he saw a tiger that almost ate him, and he comes back and tells me about it. And now, I never left the cave and was attacked by a tiger, but I know he was. And from his experience, I can actually incorporate that and build schema out of other people's experiences. Uh, you know, over time, we've basically evolved to call one of these play, and the other one's story. Uh, I think really that is the evolutionary basis of these two things. I think that they are both fundamentally educational technologies, and that's their purpose. That's why we enjoy these things and we spend so much time participating in these things. Um, linear stories, you know, are heavily based upon the idea of empathy, that I can sit there and watch a surrogate on screen, an actor, put myself in their role very easily, uh, feel what they're feeling, get a sense of what might I do in their situation, and kind of, uh, you know, learn from watching their example. Interactive play, you know, is a little bit more based on agency, which is, you know, how can I come in and affect the situation? I look at a situation, what are my options, and then I can explore, you know, those options as a player. So in one sense, you know, story is more of a ride that you're on. The director, or writer, or whatever, you know, kind of creates and crafts this experience that you're, everybody basically is going to go see the same version of Star Wars. A game is a little bit different. You know, a game is more like we're giving the player a vehicle and we're creating a landscape for them to go drive around on. We don't know exactly where they're going to drive in that landscape. Uh, that's up to them, but we're kind of designing the landscape in the vehicle. Uh, in our culture, you know, I think that we have a certain amount of time that we tend to spend with linear entertainment. Uh, and I think that curve is fairly flat across age ranges for the most part. You know, I think in interactive entertainment, you know, we have a curve that right now is still in its very early phases. You know, we see a very large wave coming from the younger group aging up right now. In fact, I think this curve is a little bit further over. I made this slide a while back, but it's moving over fairly fast, you know, so I think that you have a lot of baby boomers that have grew up with games are now playing games with their kids. But typically people will kind of play games until they start having kids and then, oh, I don't have time for that anymore. They used to spend 20 hours a week, you know, totally immersed in, you know, Doom or whatever it was. But now they're actually participating in games that are much lighter experiences. And so we used to think of casual games, you know, as games for people that didn't play games much. But I think more and more casual games are for people that used to play games a lot and still enjoy games. They just don't have the time commitment to spend, you know, 50 hours on World of Warcraft. Uh, if we dive into stories just a little bit here, um, stories tend to have, you know, a number of kind of uh, elements that we find attractive and interesting. They have, you know, archetypes, they have settings. Uh, a lot of times they have cool abilities and verbs that maybe not even, don't even exist in the real world. And of course, from these we build, you know, stories, which are kind of action, causal representations. Uh, the stereotypes, you know, are all over the map. You know, we tend to like to kind of divide them into good and evil a lot of times. Um, sometimes these stereotypes, you know, can kind of be reinterpreted. Um, through the ages, you know, Captain Kirk was really based on Horatio Hornblower uh, in a starship, but pretty much the same archetype. Some archetypes, you know, are also kind of visual or other elements can kind of evoke things that we kind of learn from ancient archetypes into more modern ones. Um, and it's interesting how much we can kind of, you know, even subconsciously use these archetypes as you know, kind of symbolic schema processing. Uh, how many of you watched Lost? I mean, this is a fairly young audience. Um, you know, really, Lost is really a, a reenactment of an older show. Gilligan's Island, it's just kind of a, it's basically a remake, but uh, 
And like, you know, Gilligan's Island, you know, like Lost, Gilligan's Island has, you know, very strong archetypes. In fact, I mean, it's been said that the characters in Gilligan's Island are all representative of the seven deadly sins. Um, when you think about it, you know, the professor's pride, uh, Marianne's jealousy, because she's always jealous of Ginger, Gilligan's sloth, Ginger lust, Mr. Howell greed, Mrs. Howell gluttony, as in conspicuous consumption, and Skipper anger. So really, you know, these are very strong archetypes, you know, that a lot of our stories are built out of archetypes, and really we're enjoying the symbolic interaction of these archetypes, you know, in a lot of stories. Uh, a lot of stories have very interesting settings, you know, sometimes they're mythical, exotic places that we would like to go. Sometimes they're very fantastical. They have, you know, rules that are very different than the worlds we live in. But still, there's always some element of truth, you know, that we can kind of map into our reality. Again, the schema that we're pulling out of these kind of experiences. They're like toy worlds in some sense. And I think we kind of, in our mind, play with them almost like toys as well. Now, stories are totally based upon the idea that there's a link of causality. You know, A causes B causes C. And, you know, basically there are interesting kind of bifurcations or choices that are going to happen. And we're engaged in the story because we kind of want to see what the next branch is going to be. And in some sense, stories try to amplify what that branch is so that, you know, one branch all of a sudden has a huge deal to do with where the story is going to go. Uh, when you think about the end of Star Wars, you know, Luke Skywalker is in his X-Wing fighter going down the trench and he's going to fire his photon torpedoes and either he's going to blow up the Death Star or he's not. You know, and it's, you know, this one little event, whether this photon torpedo goes down this little tube, is going to branch the story off in wildly different directions where the Rebel Alliance is crushed or not. Um, so in some sense, you know, what we're doing is we're leveraging what are known as chaotic systems, where minor changes in initial conditions can lead to very different outcomes. And so a lot of stories are kind of based upon this kind of chaotic system approach. Uh, really, that works in a story only because the director knows the future. And this is one of the things that fundamentally separates, I think, storytelling from games. Uh, you know, the director knows in this story that, um, you know, the sniper is about to shoot the secret agent. And if he kills the secret agent, the secret agent won't save the world. The world will go up in smoke. But the secret agent knocks over his glass and leans over just the second when the sniper is firing. Now, if the director didn't know what was going to happen in the future, he wouldn't know, you know whether knocking over that glass is important or not. So the director knows exactly where to point the camera to get the relevant chain of causality. Um, and I can't really overemphasize how important this is as a distinction between storytelling and you know, what I consider interactive entertainment. So showing that relevant causal chain is what storytelling is really all about and eliminating almost everything else. Uh, some directors, storytellers, have actually found ways um, to game that a little bit more uh, in interesting ways. Alfred Hitchcock is one of my favorite directors, and he was great at kind of using your imagination against you. And so a lot of people, when they saw his movies, were actually in some sense getting very different experiences because he was evoking things in their imagination in interesting ways. Nobody would imagine things differently uh, for the things he did not show. He once said that you know, he could show a scene of you know, some guys talking like this for five minutes and film it as the most boring thing you've ever seen. Uh, on the other hand, he could come on screen just before the scene and say, a bomb is going to go off in this room in five minutes. And then show you the exact same scene, and it would be incredibly compelling. You know? And that's a good example of the way he would kind of use tricks like that to take seemingly everyday things and kind of make them really interesting, but also distinctive and individually unique. Uh, Groundhog Day is one of my favorite uh, movies. In fact, it's one of the few linear stories that I think, uh, in some sense, tries to make an attempt at giving a sense of possibility space, space which I think games are all about. You know, on Groundhog Day, if you haven't seen it, basically this guy wakes up, he lives an entire day, he sees a chain of events, but then the next day, the clock you know, wakes him up, and the exact same day is recreated. And he does a little bit different things each day. And so it basically repeats the same day over and over, and you're actually getting some sense of all the possibilities that face somebody on one day. You know, from you know, the very first minute he gets out of bed, the day starts branching off slightly. Some days branch off more than others. But I think it's just a, an amazing kind of story about infinity, you know, infinite possibilities. Now, we're learning schema from stories. You know, a lot of times, these schema we can apply to real life. They can actually kind of help us learn in interesting ways. A lot of the schema that we learn from stories, in fact, are incorrect schema and on purpose. I mean, we kind of know that every time we have a car wreck, the car doesn't blow up. You know, but in Hollywood, it does. And we, you know, in some sense, filter that out and kind of understand that's Hollywood. Uh, I saw the last Indiana Jones movie, and it was amazing how many guns they were shooting at each other, and nobody was ever hit by a bullet, even though everybody had a machine gun, and they were all shooting each other through the whole movie, and nobody was ever hit by a bullet. Uh, I don't think it happens in real life. Uh, you know, in James Bond movies, you know, we're, we're totally, you know, uh, kind of acclimated to the idea that, you know, these evil villains um, have secret lairs and these elaborate hideouts. And it was interesting, uh, shortly after 9-11, the New York Times published this, and it was uh, basically, they were convinced that bin Laden must have a secret lair. He's an evil villain, right? 
Um, and then the, the Defense Department was even confirming it. Oh yes, he has a mountain you know, hideout. It has hospitals and power supplies, power stations and all this stuff. And uh, it was interesting just how much just everybody was acclimated to the idea that a villain of that scale needs a giant evil lair. Uh, <laughs> and of course, they like, went into Afghanistan and found these little rat holes with a few AK-47s in the back, but that was about it. Um, you know, a lot of times the uh, schema that we're learning from stories, you know, are things that, you know, we can kind of abstract in really interesting degrees. You know, be careful what kind of mushrooms you deal with. You know, you learn from Mario. You know, sometimes it's good to suck up to the boss's assistant, you know, from James Bond. Or don't always trust your parents, you know. Uh, each one of these are, you know, just kind of basic schema that we learn over time. You know, some of these schema can kind of inform us about the past, present, and future. Uh, the guy, uh, Robert Piercy, who wrote Zenigard and Motorcycle Maintenance, wrote a sequel to it called Lilla. And his kind of argument in that was that kind of our whole mythos around the cowboy, um, his ethics, the way he dealt with uh, the world, was really stolen from the Native Americans, you know. And that, that whole thing really was us trying to co-opt the Native American ethos, you know, into what we consider American frontier psychology. Uh, the TV critics have kind of postulated that Beverly Hillbillies was really an attempt to parse the modern counterculture, integrating into modern society. Uh, and Blade Runner, it's interesting because I spent a lot of time studying city planning, doing SimCity and things like that. And it's interesting how many actual city planning documents reference Blade Runner. Uh, basically, it's a dystopian state that they want to avoid. You know, there might be a downtown area, people are putting up neon lights, and they say, oh, we don't want it to turn into Blade Runner. And it's interesting, especially with things like science fiction, how effective they can be at preventing the future by predicting it. Uh, so, um, and a lot of times, you know, I'll come across things that, I'll see, I saw this story a while back, and you know, there was something about it that was like, God, that sounds so familiar. I can't imagine what, where I heard that before. And then I realized um, <laughs> that it's funny how we don't even understand the depth of the schema that we hold in, you know, that are basically causing us to reinterpret the world in interesting ways. So we have story, we have play. Uh, you know, play is kind of more the area I'm in. You know, a lot of other animals play. You know, play uh, seems to obviously have a lot of benefits beyond just humans. You know, I think it's something that uh, we instinctively do from a very early age. Um, it's something that we learn before story. I think story is more of a learned activity. Play is more instinctual in some sense. You know, play allows us the opportunity to explore possibility space within a more structured system. Uh, games do especially. They're more structured than play. Uh, you know, some games, in fact, are kind of the possibility space when you look, look at the game board. Games offer us the unique ability to restart from the exact same beginning uh, spot and explore a different branch, which is one of the reasons why when we play a game like chess or anything like that, we're, in fact, slowly building a more and more accurate map of the entire possibility space. This is something that we never really get the opportunity to do in real life. So by formalizing something into a game structure, we can actually start building maps and developing intuitions for these possibility spaces that we can really never do with real life. Uh, you know, a lot of the early games were based upon very simple branching, with you know, player branching, going down a different path, uh, kind of like choose your own adventure books, things like that. You know, more modern games are you know, getting to be more open-ended simulations, simulated worlds that uh, they in some sense are still a branching tree, except the uh, number of branches and the density of possibilities is much, much higher. Uh, it's more easily viewed as kind of a web, you know, a giant web that we're exploring, or a landscape. Uh, in The Sims, we had actually kind of thought about the game in terms of a social landscape and a material landscape. I can go for the big screen TV or more friends. A lot of times those things were kind of in opposition, but really in the game we wanted you to balance the two. And, you know, in that sense, you know, The Sims was at this level, the gameplay landscape level, like bowling. You really wanted to, bowl, you know, roll the ball right up the aisle. If you went too far down one side or the other, you were stuck on local maxima. It's kind of like the gutter in bowling. So this is, you know, when we work on games, we tend to think in terms of what is the higher level possibility of the landscape that the player is exploring. And in fact, we're, you know, generating data and measuring this stuff as well. This is actually a measurement of a thousand Sims players playing over a hundred Sims days, basically on those exact same axes. And we can actually study, you know, which one of those directions are players going down the most? Where do they fan out? Where do they converge? And so by looking at the high level play patterns, we can actually understand that possibility space, even though the real possibility space is, you know, thousands of dimensions, we can collapse into a smaller number and discover kind of behavioral patterns. Um, so kids basically are playing games, you know, in some sense I think they're really exhibiting, you know, the scientific method, you know, the way they're kind of dealing with these things. They're building model worlds that they can later apply to the real world, you know, based upon the agency that they have in the game. Uh, you know, in some sense I think that, you know, play is one of the primary ways in which we are building these models in our imagination. And games are one of the primary ways in which we then test those models. Uh, and we could just as well strike out, you know, models here and put in imagination. I think that um, this is, in some sense, kind of this yin-yang relationship between general play and games. You know, uh, 
a lot of games and play really, in fact, are not just ways to build the imagination, but kind of scaffolding to build larger and larger imaginary worlds upon. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, when he wrote Treasure Island, first thing he did was he drew this map of this island with all these little coves and places to go, and then he just sat there and stared at it for two days and imagined all the adventures that might happen on this landscape. And from that emerged the narrative of Treasure Island. So really, Treasure Island was the result of his kind of mental play experience on there. Uh, you know, a lot of game worlds really are like that. You know, Grand Theft Auto, when I think about the world in there, I really could care less about the missions except for the fact that they unlock the world and they give me a larger space to then create my own stories over this landscape. In The Sims, we allowed players to actually capture screenshots of what they were doing, annotate those and share them, and they would build these, you know, elaborate kind of comic book graphic novels. Some of these were hundreds of pages long and uh, just really uh, amazing stories, you know, that hundreds of thousands of people would come and read and give them feedback. Um, we allow them to share this, you know, on our website. Uh, a lot of people also make, you know, of course, movies out of games, machinima, stuff like that. So it's amazing how things can kind of start as an entertainment activity, you know, a game, and turn into a creative activity, you know, of self-expression like that. So in these cases, you know, what's happening, you know, we're going from entertaining these people in more of a broadcast model to them entertaining each other. You know, they're doing stuff in these games and creating things that are as entertaining to each other as the original game that we're kind of giving to them. So. A lot of stories, when I really think about them, the stories that I like the most are ones that I like to deconstruct in my head. They have interesting characters, interesting worlds, interesting cool toys, etc. Um, you know, after seeing these things, I kind of wonder, you know, what would win between a battle, an Imperial uh, battle cruiser, Cylon, Base Star, or the Borg Cube, you know? And in fact, I found a really long internet thread about this very topic. Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Um, you know, what happens if we send Jim, James Bond against Osama bin Laden? Uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you had, you know, the kind of magic abilities of Harry Potter or you could fly around the city like Spider-Man? Of course, in games, we can give players kind of these abilities, you know, in these kind of toy worlds. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that some of the best stories, really, I deconstruct in my head and they lead to a lot of play experiences. You know, I get a lightsaber, my friend has a lightsaber, and now we're having, you know, Star Wars. And basically, I've deconstructed the story and the components, and now it's generating play experiences. On the other hand, some of the best games are the ones for me that are generative, that I'm sitting there and creating and able to be very uh, kind of uniquely expressive in. I love Grand Theft Auto just because the kind of stories I can play out and the kind of weird creative things I can do in it are extraordinary. Um, when I play it, I usually really get into my character and I tell my family, oh, guess what Bruno did today? And yeah, we got this, stole this great car and then ran over this guy and then it crashed and then I jumped the river, it was so cool, you know. And it has nothing to do with the missions, it's just kind of me telling the story about what Bruno did today. Um, you know, The Sims, Players did that a lot. You know, in The Sims, one of the things we wanted to do was actually have also the, uh, when The Sims died, we wanted to have real repercussions. I'd never seen a game where when characters died in a game that there were actual repercussions from that death. So when a character dies in The Sims, they can actually, you know, all the people that knew them, that loved them, are inconsolable for days. There's a long grieving period in The Sims. Uh, depending on how they died, if it was very violent, they could actually come back and uh, haunt the people, you know. Or, you know, it might have been a peaceful death, in which case the Sims just kind of eventually get over their grief and reminisce about them. But, uh, you know, death is as valid a thing to play with, you know, in games as anything else, I think. You know, I'm just kind of surprised that more games don't actually play with the overall dynamic of death, you know, rather than just the character falling down dead and disappearing. Uh, games have this interesting property that, first of all, there are these different interaction loops. You know, when you first play Mario, you pick up the controller, you start pressing buttons, and in the first few seconds, you kind of figure out, oh, that makes Mario hop, that makes him go left and right. And after you've mastered that few second interaction loop, which is the innermost one, then you go to the next one. Oh, what does this mushroom do? What is that you know, turtle about? And that's a little bit longer interaction loop. Each one of these interaction loops has basically a success side and a failure side. Only when I master how to move Mario in the first few seconds, that inner loop, do I now get access to the next interaction loop and the next. And then eventually it's, you know, how do I get past the boss? Uh, so games, you know, have these nested loops and every loop has basically a success side and a failure side. This is roughly, you know, the kind of loops in The Sims, where basically I had to master how to move and interact before I could do anything. Now I had to deal with the needs of my Sims, you know, and then they were peeing on the floor and collapsing of sleep uh, until I figured out how to kind of deal with that. And then I got to the next level of having to actually get them, you know, money and earn them a job. One thing we've uh, discovered that's kind of counterintuitive is that players really enjoy exploring the failure side of this more than the success side. Uh, so I've always gone out of my way to give, you know, my games a lot of interesting failure states. It's important that the failures are varied, that the player understands why they happened, um, but they love exploring them in a lot of different kind of directions. I think failure-based learning is actually one of the biggest kind of uh, interesting things that games do differently than formal education. We used to have this model of teaching people through apprenticeship. You would go work for a furniture maker 
and he would actually show you how to make chairs. And you would start making chairs, and you'd make a bunch of crappy chairs. And slowly over time, those chairs get better and better and better. Um, around the turn of the last century, we took a lot of our kind of design professions and flipped it around. And we said, no, we're going to put you in school. And you're going to go through you know, four years, five years, six years of school before you ever touch a chair. We're going to protect you from failure by teaching you all this theory ahead of time so that when you go out, the first chair you make is going to be pretty good. But you've never directly experienced failure, which is a very different model than I think the way people are dealing with in games. There was uh, a story I read. It was actually about a pottery class. And the teacher decided at the beginning of his class to divide the class into two equal halves. And they told one half of the class, OK, your entire grade is going to be based upon one pot. I want you to make the best pot you possibly can, and the quality of that pot is going to determine your grade. Uh, he told the other half of the class, OK, I don't care how bad your pots are. Your grade is based on how many you make. Uh, just make as many as you can, and I don't care how junky they are. The more you make, the better your grade. Of course, all the best pots came from the second half of the class that was going for quantity. They made a bunch of bad pots, but they made so many pots, they learned very, very quickly from failure, much more than the first group that spent a lot of time studying what the perfect pot was and really just kind of fretted over making that one thing. So I think that you know, we've lost something by trying to protect students a little bit too much from failure when we kind of send them out in the world doing design things. Back to games and story, you know, I think that uh, emotionally, a lot of people also talk about games as lacking emotional content. And I don't really think that's true. Uh, you know, we have you know, a wide range of emotions that we you know, can get very easily from linear storytelling. Um, but at the same time, I think I get emotions from games that I've never actually experienced in linear storytelling. Things like accomplishment, guilt, pride. Uh, I remember when I got black and white, you know, the first thing I did uh, is I had my little character on screen. And I started just beating him up just to see what would happen. And pretty soon, he was like downtrodden and crying. And, you know, I remember after doing that, even though I knew it was a simulated character in memory, I felt really bad. I mean, I really felt guilty for beating up this little simulated character just to see what would happen. And I've never felt guilty, you know, watching any movie or reading any book, because it was always the character in there that was doing it. It was never any agency by me in the story. So back to this loop here, I think that inherently the most interesting play experiences for me are generative and lead to the widest variety of stories. So I think story and play kind of have this self-supporting thing back and forth here. I don't really think that they're at odds with each other. I think that they're, you know, it's almost like matter and energy. There's kind of a, a transmission from one to the other and back to the first. So I think both of these, you know, again, are forms of model building. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what the property is, what the environment, what the thing is. Uh, they're all toy worlds that I can kind of work with, play with, create, tell stories in that allow me to develop schema pattern strategies for kind of um, dealing with the real world. Oh, uh, I don't know if we have time for the Russian Space Minute. Um, do you want to hear this about Russian Space Minute? Or should, oh, OK. Uh, I just love to do this because I get tired of talking about games all the time. Because people always say, come talk about games. They never tell me to come talk about Russian Space Program for some reason. Um, <clears throat> but it's one of my kind of passions. The Russian Space Program has these amazingly weird, interesting stories. And I like just you know, telling little ones here and there. Uh, this one is about, so you use 18A, April 1975. Uh, 18A is kind of important here because they had to do a B later. Um, these two guys went up into space. They were going to the Salyut space station. Uh, they were going to spend three months on the space station. And um, on their way up, you know, first of all, on their way to the launch pad, they got in the truck and were heading to the launch pad. And like every mission, you know, they stopped halfway to the launch pad, got out, and urinated on the front tire. Uh, because that's what Yuri Gagarin did. He really had to go on his very first mission, so he stopped and peed on the front tire of the truck. And since he made it on his first flight, all the cosmonauts assumed that, oh, okay, that's why he made it. And so it's now a tradition in the Russian space program that they always stop halfway, even the women, and urinate on the front tire of the truck. Uh, so at any rate, they got in the spaceship, blasted off. Now, um, everything was going well at first, but then they had an issue. Uh, this is a Soyuz rocket, an R7. Uh, it's a three-stage rocket, first stage, second stage. Uh, the first stage separated cleanly. The second stage, when it came time for it to separate from the third stage, the separation mechanism didn't work. So the dead second stage was still attached, which totally threw off the trajectory of the rocket. Um, it had an escape tower uh, on the top of it. And this is, in fact, the only time one of these escape towers, we had them on the American Apollos as well, this is the only time one ever actually fired in flight. Uh, now, the way this escape tower was supposed to work is if there was a launch pad disaster or misfire on the pad, that escape tower would pull the capsule away parachute would open, it would land safely. Uh, in this case, the rocket was way, way high, going very, very fast, and then the second stage stuck. And so the rocket was about at this out attitude when the uh, escape rocket fired. Now, so at this point, they're just blasting down at incredible velocity. 
And it was just a miracle that when the parachute opened, it didn't shred the pieces. It did shred, but it slowed them down enough so they could survive the landing. Uh, they lost most of their teeth in the impact uh, of the parachute, even before they hit the ground. Um, but at any rate, they did survive that. They came down in this very, very rough mountainous region, you know, many thousands of kilometers downrange from where they ever expected an emergency landing. Uh, landed on a very steep slope, actually, and their capsule went rolling down the hill toward a precipice. And uh, right before the edge of the precipice, their shredded parachute caught a tree, which saved them from going over the edge of the precipice. Um, that's when they got out and they realized that they were in China, uh, <laughs> about 50 kilometers over the border. Uh, and um, the, uh, this is back kind of when the Chinese and the Russians didn't get along well at all. And, uh, it took them about 20 hours to actually for the Russians to figure out where they had landed. And the Chinese hadn't discovered it. They didn't even know this had happened yet. So the cosmonauts spent overnight on top of this mountaintop, basically, you know, defending themselves from wolves and freezing. They built a fire. Um, luckily, they had guns to defend themselves from wolves from, based on previous missions. On every mission now, the Russians carried both guns and vodka with them, you know, in their capsules, <laughs> which kind of differentiates them from NASA to some degree. Uh, but at any rate, you know, eventually the Russians figured out where they were. They mounted a secret rescue mission and brought all these giant helicopters and recovered not only the cosmonauts, but the capsule itself, got them back across the border before the Chinese realized what had happened. Um, the Russians, you know, after that, they basically were denied their 3,000 ruble space flight pay because they never made it into space. But, uh, <laughs> but after appealing it, they finally, uh, Brezhnev actually uh, ended up paying them for it. Um, but anyway, that's the end of the Russian space movement. Uh, and that's all a true story, by the way. Uh, so, Back to the game design. Now, uh, as a game designer, I get a lot of people basically sending me game design ideas, you know, all the time. They typically look like this. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people kind of assume that, you know, if you play games, you know, you know how to make games. Um, and it's not always the case. Uh, games obviously have this heritage. A lot of it's coming from linear media storytelling, as I mentioned. But, you know, really games draw from a much wider variety, I think, of inspirations in formats. Uh, you know, things like architecture, product design, you know, cognitive psychology are all things that kind of games pull from. That's actually one of the things that interests me a lot about games, is the fact that um, it seems like of all the design fields, you know, games in some sense have the most possibility space. They draw from so many different areas, and where they can go into the future uh, seems in some sense less limited than almost any other thing I can think of design-wise. Uh, any kind of design thing really has a number of properties, any kind of design artifact that the designer is really trying to balance. You know, you want it to be affordable, you want it to be, you know, in this case, comfortable, repairable, etc. And it's the designer kind of um, balancing all these factors because a lot of these are in opposition to each other. Uh, you can actually kind of, you know, make a hierarchy of these things. It kind of fall into groups. There's almost a taxonomy of design considerations, and the designer is basically balancing plates all the way down the chain. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a chair or a game. Uh, this is, you know, as I see it, primarily the designer's role. You know, now the player is building a mental model of your system, and you know, that's one of the interesting things that, you know, as a designer, I'm always trying to keep in mind is that the players are building a model, and it's up to me to control the model that they're building. And you know, everything I present to them is gonna cause them to build that model in a, you know, an interesting way, maybe the wrong way. Uh, there's this thing, the Amazon Turk, probably a lot of you have heard about, a chess playing device built back in the 1800s, that in fact was a little guy hidden in the back here that would put his arm up and play chess very well against these you know, noblemen. Um, they opened the cabinet and would show all these gears and stuff, and they, you know, the little guy was hidden way in the back, and people in the 1800s were kind of aware that machines could do all these amazing things, and so they were uh, controlling the middle model that people built of this in such a way that everybody they showed it to was convinced that it was a mechanical chess playing uh, machine, when in fact it wasn't at all. You know, in fact, that's what magicians do. Magicians are great at getting you to build exactly the wrong model, and then just at the last second, they destroy the model that you had, and that's what really the, you know, element of magic is, and that's frequently why they have an attractive assistant to exactly the right time when they need to divert your attention to do their little thing. Again, they're controlling your attention so that they know what information you have coming into your brain to build the model they want you to build. Um, we do this at many different levels, you know, as game designers, even product designers. You know, when I study uh, something like a city to design a simulation, you know, that's one aspect. I'm building a model out of that real world thing. But then we put that in a box, and even the design of that box is a model. When a person walks into a store and they see that box, right off the bat, from the box, they are building a, a model in their head of the game, and they're playing that game in their imagination. I wonder what that game is about. Looks like it's about buildings. If that game's interesting enough that they just built in a few seconds, you know, by looking at the front of the box, 
they might pick up the box and turn it over, read the back of the box, and they build a more elaborate model. If that model is still fun to play, you know, again, they haven't touched your real game yet, they might actually buy it and bring it home and try play it. So in some sense, we want to control the model that they're building even before they play the game. You know, a lot of the games that I built are built around established metaphors. You know, so SimCity, right off the bat, you kind of look at it and say, oh, I see, it's kind of like a train set coming to life. Um, a lot of times there are deeper metaphors involved. You know, when people play SimCity for a while, they start realizing, no, it's really more like gardening. I'm kind of tilling the soil, I'm fertilizing it, planting things, and then watching it grow. So the metaphor can change over time. Uh, the Sims, you know, was pretty obviously kind of a computerized dollhouse, although I stopped calling that, that from the first focus group when people heard dollhouse, and these were 25-year-old guys that liked guns. Uh, it seemed like a non-starter, and in fact, I had a really hard time getting support for the game, you know, after calling it a dollhouse. But as a game designer, I spent a lot of time trying to think as an anthropologist, you know, studying what the players do, uh, their artifacts, um, trying to understand what motivates them. And we're seeing more and more in games that it's about the community that builds up around the game. There are different levels of participation in these communities, starting from very casual players that might come in and start, you know, collecting stuff, building websites, uh, maybe creating stuff for the games. Uh, this is something that, you know, we spend a lot of time studying, and it's very much like an ecology, you know, with this kind of pyramid of supporting, you know, hierarchies. You know, sometimes I've even gone in and tried to measure this and studied kind of what causes people to be, you know, promoted from one level to the next or drop out. Uh, there's definitely kind of a flow within these communities. Sometimes it's a content flow, you know, from the top down. Other times it's a recognition flow. The broad, you know, casual base are giving a lot of recognition to the artists and creators at the top, and that's what really fuels them. You know, that's what they live on. Uh, when I think about the future of gaming, um, it's always a little dicey, you know, when you think about the future of gaming, where it might go. Uh, typically, you know, when these discussions come up, uh, well, one thing about games that's interesting is I think, you know, games have probably done more, you know, to advance, you know, just the basic computer industry than almost anything else I can think of. You know, really games are to computers as, you know, racing is to cars. Uh, there's no reason why you need this incredible graphics card in your computer that does a billion polygons per second, except for games. So. In some sense, you know, gaming has been the driving factor in the technology on our desktop. And it, we're seeing it even now, you know, with mobile devices. You know, I think a lot of the power that we're getting in mobile devices is being driven by entertainment applications. Um, typically, when people think about the future of gaming, they think about things like artificial intelligence, you know, graphics, physics, uh, simulation, uh, user-generated content, obviously, has been very big. Uh, I tend to think in a little bit different kind of uh, arena. I tend to think, you know, more in terms of uh, these things, which I know a lot of these aren't terribly obvious what I mean by them, and I'll just go into them briefly. But it's kind of a different way of looking at things. Fractal entertainment, really, for me, is a way of uh, thinking, like I said at the beginning of the Q&A section, how do we think of entertainment as something that happens across a wide variety of platforms, you know, different form factors, different time factors? If you imagine something like Star Wars, you know, they had kind of the first, uh, well, actually, fractal-like, I mean, in, you know, not just in time, but also in scale and quantity and across platform. Uh, Star Wars, they had like the major movies, the first three movies, then the uh, prequel movies. But aside from that, they also had books kind of filling in the gaps here and there. And they, they had toys. They had, you know, all these different experiences that filled out in like this fractal-like way. I think this is something that, you know, is becoming more and more established in entertainment. Um, we kind of have, you know, in entertainment these broad areas I can imagine. You know, we have, we talked about story and play a lot here, but there's also like branding and identity. And by branding, I mean kind of self-branding. These are things where you put the poster up, you know, or wear the T-shirt, et cetera. Collectibles. Um, you can pick almost anything, you know, entertainment-wide, and uh, like Ninja Turtles, which started out, in fact, as a comic book, then became a, you know, high-end collectible, then a television show, and so very successful properties, you know, kind of fill in this, you know, in different directions, and they kind of will pop, you know, there actually flows within this landscape where something that starts as a movie is most likely to then go into a game or a book, and so there are currents within this. In the storytelling side, uh, well, in games there's this concept of a magic circle. Uh, probably a lot of you have heard this term. Uh, hands? Okay. Well, storytelling, I think, actually has a lot of the same kind of ideas. This is really the idea that when people are playing a game, they're making a, you know, a pact with themselves. We are going to abide by the rules of this game. You're either in the circle or you're outside. You can be outside as an observer, uh, and you're not bound by the rules of the game. I think storytelling has kind of had similar thing, you know, kind of like story circles. We have these like kind of socially acceptable ways to tell and consume stories. They probably started out like this, sitting around a campfire, you know, a tribal elder telling a story. Over time, we started to kind of um, formalize that a little bit more. You know, the Greek theater, uh, Victorian theater. You know, over time, we came up with more and more formal, you know, kind of formats and settings in which stories were told and consumed, as well as the structure of stories themselves. Things like the three act structure. This is something that games don't really have as much today. 
Um, you know, and then the, you know, the modern movie theater. After that, it was kind of interesting. You know, we got the television in the home. Uh, these groups that were slowly getting larger and larger and grander and grander productions now started shrinking back down. You know, we're dealing with you know, shorter format television shows, smaller groups of sitting around. You know, now we're getting comfortable with the idea of sitting there, you know, watching movies individually on these little tiny screens. Or even you know, the idea of 50 people sitting on an airplane all watching 50 different things at once doesn't seem odd to us. Uh, so in some sense, um, that magic circle of storytelling is fractalizing as well. We have you know, this wide diversity of kind of storytelling environments, uh, as well as game environments. And so I think both of these are kind of fractalizing in this way. Uh, topics as well, you know. <laughs> so we all know the internet's a series of tubes. Um, and probably most of you are familiar with the idea of a power law distribution, in that you know, certain things, uh, like you know, Barack Obama probably has a lot of hits on the internet. There are probably a lot of web pages mentioning him. You know, Britney Spears probably has a lot as well, but not as much as Barack Obama. Um, you know, some uh, baseball star from 50 years or 30 years ago probably has a lot less. You know, so you can take any topic and there's basically this kind of power law distribution, you know, not just of the way we're consuming this, but even of the content that's going through those platforms. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by fractal entertainment. Non-immersive games, very briefly, uh, you know, it used to be the biggest compliment you could pay to a game was that, oh, it was incredibly immersive. I was there late at night playing Doom on my computer, all the lights were off, and I was so into it, the whole world evaporated and disappeared around me. But nowadays, you know, we're breaking away from that. You know, the Wii was one of the things instrumental, I think, in starting this. When I'm watching, you know, when I'm playing the Wii, most of the entertainment for me isn't coming from what's on the screen, it's coming from watching what the players around me are doing. Watching them goofily swinging around and doing stuff like, you know. So that's a lot of the entertainment is now opening back up to the social group that I'm with, interacting with. You know, and just, you know, there's always a possibility to go and throw the uh, remote through the screen as well. So kind of physicalizing, you know, the gameplay, uh, is uh, one of these things that I'm kind of talking about non-immersive, pulling the game back out of the computer, back into my real world context. You know, the music games like Rock Band, same thing. You know, the, watching the other people around me play and the way they perform is far more entertaining than me watching little notes go down the screen. The little notes down the screen are just a catalyst for that to happen. Uh, mobile devices are, you know, one of the really interesting drivers of this whole dynamic. You know, it's, uh, first we're gonna of course have games where I'm sitting there playing Tetris on my cell phone, but the really interesting ones I think are games that are gonna be aware of where I am and what I'm doing and are context aware, which is, you know, there's kind of the old idea of virtual reality, which is now moving to augmented reality, the idea that we're gonna be able to start blending these realities together, that can be out in the real world, blending in these synthetic realities on top of it, having things come to life kind of right in front of my eyes, you know, invent invisible characters that I'm interacting with that nobody else can see. I mean, just the possible directions we can take this are pretty unlimited. Um, there'll be a fair amount of utility to this as well. You know, once we have these systems, and in fact, we pretty much have these right now on our mobile devices, um, we're gonna just, be, you know, come to rely on these. These will be part of our perception. Uh, you know, I'll be able to walk around the city and decide, do I go down this street or that street? And I can get crime statistics for the last month to make my decision. I can look up to the sky and actually see the weather fronts, you know, symbolic patterns, you know, as my weather report. Or just glance at a restaurant and get a kind of real-time uh, review of the restaurant. But these things pretty much are all available right now on my cell phone. So this is happening uh, incredibly fast. You know, the hardware that just a few years ago was incredibly bulky and seemed like who would want that, you know, is now on everybody's iPhone. Uh, and I'm just going to speed through this stuff a bit here. Um, so these things that basically were, you know, totally separate functions when I was growing up are now collapsed in this one little tiny thing in my pocket. Uh, now I'm wondering about the time here. I'm probably going to blast through uh, is Ken around? Let me just, yeah, um, how are we doing on time? It's 7, 12. Okay, all right, I think I'll wrap up here. I've got about 100 more slides, so I didn't get to the end. <laughs> I went as fast as I could, uh, but I think Ken wanted me to, you still want to do some Q&A? Um, I don't know, I think we're like nibbling over time now. Oh, so should we stop and just go to the next, uh, just say goodbye? Yeah, I'm going to blame it on you, whatever you say. I think, I think you should give just like an amazing like, wrap-up to your talk. An amazing wrap-up, okay. Uh, yeah, so bandwidth uh, has been really low. The verbs have been very uh, low, but getting much higher. Psychology of the player matters a whole lot. Um, computers really are amplifiers for our brain, but more importantly, our imagination. Uh, AI sucks. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, harvesting human intelligence is great, especially like the Krell did it. Um, and so, like the Krell, in the Spore, we wanted to harvest hum uh, human creativity and basically turn players from consumers to producers, you know, through all these things that they're already kind of leaning in towards. 
uh, which is good because once we do this, that, and the other, the area of that goes up. And <laughs> that area is good. Uh, and so we want the tools to be fun, not feel like tools, and make them feel like toys, uh, et cetera. And yeah, I don't want to go into that one. Uh, <laughs> Oh, comp compression is very good. And I won't go into why, but compression is one of the coolest things in the world and has lots of benefit for lots of different reasons. Um, and players like to share stuff, of course, as well. Uh, I'm getting toward, yeah, okay. Well, actually, this is an interesting statistic. In Spore, we've had, well, this is an old slide, 45 million. We're over 100 million assets in Spore right now. Um, we got 45 million in the first 30, 63 days by making the tools fun to use, which is about 700,000 a day or about 30,000 an hour. So if you can make the tools, the creative tools, fun for players to use, you get amazing stuff, you know, just in vast quantities. When players exceed our expectations, they usually do it by orders of magnitude, not by a little bit. And uh, these are kind of general properties that we use when designing player tools. We want players to create cool stuff. We want them to be high leverage, fun, useful. Social and multi-purpose. We want them to take, be able to take assets out of the game into other areas. So I think we're just kind of uh, at the top, tip of the iceberg there. Capturing data from players is great. Um, it's kind of spooky, but great. Uh, we're going to do interesting things. Eventually, we're going to be able to make games that are like your dreams, that are as unique to you as your dreams. Your games will actually be able to evolve to fit you uniquely, which I think is one of the most interesting things that games are going to be able to do that no other format has been able to do. And lastly, you know, games really want to be relevant. They want to be things about they want to be about the world that you're really living in. And the more relevant they are to you and your life, uh, the more value they're going to have to you. Uh, I kind of grew up in an environment where I had three channels. Uh, now I have a robot to watch TV for me. Uh, <laughs> I measured my music before in terms of how much it weighed. You know, now it's massless. And news is something you consumed once a day. And now I get it every five minutes. Um, this is something I actually grew up uh, in to some degree. It's called a library. Uh, this is the Library of Congress. The non-digital content Library of Congress is about 20 terabytes. And you know, next year, you're going to be able to buy a one terabyte thumb drive, which means you'll be able to hold the digital equivalent of the Library of Congress in your hand. Uh, so it's actually pretty amazing that information is not the issue. We always thought that when kids had the Library of Congress in their bedroom, that they, you know, education is solved, right? That was never the issue. The issue is motivation. How do we motivate people? Uh, so really, games, play, toys, et cetera, I think the most beneficial thing they can do for education is to motivate kids, get them interested in subjects and the world, and you know, once they're interested, you know, try to stop them from learning, and you're not going to be able to. You know? And also, social currency is one of the things that people kind of come away. It's a huge benefit to people. And we're seeing this evolution where people are gravitating toward things that are more and more about them. You know, it's really about how narcissistic are people. At first, it's about my world. Then it's about improving me. Now it's specifically about me and my friends. So I think really the time that they spend playing times of social relevance equals the impact. Uh, typically, we've got that one covered, the time playing. If we can get the social relevance up, um, the world impact should be tremendous. And so, well, that's not actually what that slide meant. But uh, it used to be about once a generation, the world changed. It just radically changed all the rules, you know. Um, but these changes, these amazing, you know, landmarks in our history are coming faster and faster. Um, and the challenges that we're facing are coming faster and faster to us. And so where the world goes from here, you know, we just don't know. But the ability for us to see it through different lenses, see it through different kind of points of view, build different models of where it might go are more important now than they ever, ever have been. And I think tools, you know, like games, toys, uh, are really our probably strongest tool for building our imagination to kind of understand these worlds. Uh, in some sense, really, it's an amplifier for imagination. So that's slide 300, by the way. So I'm finished. <laughs> Sorry if I went over. Uh, uh. Okay, so thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, sorry we don't have more time for questions, but he's wonderful. Let's give him a big applause.